book of Exodus uh, chapter 14 and I want to read to you verses 10 through 18. And this is what the word of the Lord says. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said, Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness and Moses said to the people fear not stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work out for you today for the Egyptians whom you see today you shall never see again the Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent the Lord said to Moses why do you cry out to me tell the people of Israel go forward lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on the dry ground and I will harden the hearts of Egyptians so that they shall go in after them and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord and have gotten glory when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. And everybody said, Amen. What has taken place here in chapter 14 of the book of Exodus is, to, is familiar to most of the people in this room. Even if your church attendance has not been so good. Even if you couldn't graduate from the Sunday school, you surely have seen Prince of Egypt. And you know, how many of you have seen the Prince of Egypt? If you have not, you should watch it. You should watch it. As a reminder for you this morning, that what's taken place here is the Israelites have been in captivity. Better, better said, they were in slavery for 430 years. It's a long time. Generations have passed. 430 years serving Pharaoh. 430 years working for free. Building the pyramids. Now if slavery was not enough, what happens in this book, what you find out is a new Pharaoh has risen up and has come to power. Now this Pharaoh is not like the one that was before. This Pharaoh is actually afraid of Israelites. Why is he so afraid of Israelites? Why is he, the next guy all of a sudden is afraid? I mean, you have to understand, he's afraid not for no reason. He's afraid for a reason. You know what the reason is? And I felt like when I was reading this story, that was one of the first things that the Lord has highlighted me, highlighted for me. The first thing that he was afraid because they were multiplying. He was afraid because all of a sudden things begin to shift and things begin to change. All of a sudden going from one, two, three, four, the nation begins to grow. What happens when the nation begins to grow? The nation begins to take territory. And when the nation begins to take territory, the nation begins to take territory, all of a sudden the Pharaoh is afraid because they, it is one thing for them to just, you know, live their lives on autopilot. But what they started doing is they started to enter into the promise that the Lord promised to Abraham. What happens is whenever you begin to live your life in the promises of the living God, something begins to fight against you. That's what happens when you begin to be, what happened was they were birthing, they were getting pregnant and birthing new life. Whenever you get pregnant with the things and the promises of the Lord, nothing happens in the first place. Things seem to be fine when you're just getting ready to do something. Now there's some opposition, there's fear, doubt, anxiety, insecurity. But then all hell begins to break loose when you begin to birth and give birth to the things that got started in your heart. Are you following me? 
So what's beginning to happen, this new Pharaoh arises and he doesn't like what the nation of Israel is doing. They don't, he doesn't like them multiplying and taking more territory. And so what he does is with his demonic mind, he starts a genocide. You know the story. He comes out with a verdict and an edict that any Hebrew boys that are going to get born, they will die. All the Hebrew male children will be put to death because he knows this is the demonic agenda of the, of the, of the king of this world. In order to destroy a people, he doesn't go after you. He goes after your children. That's what you and I have to absolutely get. He is after our children. To eradicate people, to eradicate Christianity, what is he going to do? He's not going to mess with your mind. He's going to mess with the mind of your children. While all, while all you think is that they're going to turn out fine because I turned out fine. They live in a new world that you have not lived in yet. They have more temptations than you have, than you can't even imagine. We got to fight for our children. And so he begins the genocide of the children. And what I absolutely love, in the middle of this demonic agenda, there's always these beautiful words, but God. Do I have any people in this house that know the power of this word? But God. When it seems like nothing is going to turn out and nothing. But God does what only God could do. Now God hears the cry of the people. What God begins to do is he selects. He orchestrates a deliverance plan for them through a very special and very unique person by the name of Moses. There's a reason I say that Moses was unique. Moses was bicultural. He was not like everybody else. Moses was born a Hebrew but raised Egyptian. Moses was lived in Egypt but he had a heart for his people. Moses was not like everybody else. Moses was unique because he had the access to the palace. Moses could come in and get out at any time that he wishes. And so there's a moment where Moses encounters God at a burning bush. And God gives him a specific assignment with the very specific words. And you remember the words. I need you to go to Pharaoh because I've heard the cry of my people. So Moses packs his bags and he goes to Pharaoh. And what is he doing? He delivers to him a simple message. God told me to tell you, let my people go. And Pharaoh, unfortunately, is not moved by Moses' message. <laughs> Pharaoh does not care what Moses has to bring to the table. Pharaoh looks at him and says, no, I'm not letting nobody go. And what happens later is God enacts 10 different plagues through Moses. The plagues were simply to let Egypt, to let Pharaoh and let the people of Israel know that the hand of God is upon Moses. Moses is used by God to initiate a plague after plague after plague so that everybody will know that surely the hand of God is upon Moses. Now, when you read this story, what you realize is that nine plagues do not move the heart of Pharaoh. It's when the tenth plague happens, all of a sudden, Pharaoh changes his mind. You see, the ninth plague didn't really affect him because it didn't really happen to him. Everything changes in Pharaoh's life when all of a sudden you've been killing children, but it's not the same when your child gets killed. You were okay killing the children of Israel, but all of a sudden when the death angel visits your house, you change your mind. And so you know what you know is he summons Moses and the Hebrews. And in my translation, he looks at him, Mo, you have to get on out of here. Pack your bags, take your children, your flocks, your herbs, and your smells and get out of here. And so what happens is they get on out of there. And in chapter 12, he momentarily repeals slavery. He tells Moses, enough is enough. And the Bible says that 600,000 men without women or children follow Moses out of Egypt. As a matter of fact, what I see is so beautiful that happens in the beginning of the story. The Bible doesn't just say 600 men besides women and children. The Bible actually says it wasn't just women and children. 
Bible says, and a mixed multitude. Did you catch that from the very beginning? It says, and a mixed multitude. Because here's what you have to understand. Hebrew and Israelites are not used synonymously. Israelites were part of the Hebrews, but Hebrews incorporated, incorporated in themselves a mixed multitude of different kinds of people. And so what you see from the very beginning, something that you cannot miss, what was done prophetically, when God begins to deliver people, He doesn't just deliver His own people, He delivers all people that join His people. <laughs> what you see from the very beginning, God does not just favor one segment of society. He says, listen, if you want to come with, doesn't matter what your color is, what your race is, what your background is, you're coming with because God doesn't want to just save y'all. He wants to save all people. That's why this place is not a museum for the elite it's not a place for special colors and special backgrounds no this place is a hospital for all different kinds of people because we have a heart of God here that understands that he had died so that all have a chance to know who he is and so it's so beautiful to see from the very beginning that when God gives them a promise and begins to lead them out, He doesn't just lead them out, but all a mixed multitude. It's almost a prophetic word that the, the salvation was coming to the Gentiles. And I don't know if you know, but we are Gentiles and we are saved by the grace of God through faith. Amen. And so 600,000 people, not counting man and woman, follow Moses out of Egypt which we can assume, plus a mixed multitude with women and children, we can easily assume a million people follow Moses. Over a million people make a decision that we will follow this one man by the name. You, the question you should be asking yourself, why in the world would they follow one man? How a million people would decide to follow one man? Well, they follow one man because he was not just a regular man. They believed that Moses hears God. They believed that Moses was not an ordinary man. Because of the plagues that they have seen over and over and over again, they're convinced that Moses is moving because God is moving him. They're convinced that Moses is obeying and listening to God. They're convinced that God is with him. But no, everything changes. All of a sudden you find out from the, in the beginning of chapter 14, everything is fine. But then, you get to, but then you get to verse 10 of chapter 14. And all of a sudden all hell breaks loose. All hell begins to break loose in verse 10 because they got two problems. And their first problem is they hear a sound and somebody dares to turn around. And to their surprise, what they find out is that they're not in this wilderness alone. Dust is in the air. Somebody turns around and what they see shocks them. They see a sea of soldiers. They see chariots. They see Pharaoh is coming after them. And it doesn't take a genius that it's not going to end well. They begin to regret the decision that they have made. They begin to realize that the Pharaoh probably had a meeting with his economic council who told them, listen, we've built this nation on these slaves. What are you doing letting them go? What are you doing letting them go? Free labor. You got to bring them back. So they're chasing the Hebrews. A million people on foot while being chased by chariots and horses. And that they realize that this is a problem. But here's the, pro here's the reality. Their biggest problem is not necessarily what's behind them. The bigger problem that they're facing in this moment is what's ahead of them. Because when you read this Bible, you find out that when they look in front of them, they find out that they have landed at the seashore, at the seashore of the Red Sea. Now, I know that you know how the story ends, but it's not how it begins. What you realize is they come upon the Red Sea following this one man, Moses, and they realize that there's nowhere else to go. They land at the sea, they look up, and there's no bridge over the sea. There's no bridge over the troubled waters. There's no path straight in the middle. What they realize is there are no boats waiting for them. And what happens is they do what church people are so good at doing. They complain. Turn to your neighbor and tell him he's talking about you. 
What they say to Moses, Moses, didn't we tell you, leave us alone. Let me live my life here in Egypt. I'm tired of you. Listen, Pharaoh is right behind us. We don't got nowhere to go. Moses, you done messed up. Notice that there's no God talk in all of this. It was all of a sudden, Moses, you done messed up. Because their realization of the Red Sea and no way to cross it has put some doubt in their heart whether Moses is really following God. Moses, what are you doing? Because we, they understood if Moses is following God truly how he said he's following God, then we wouldn't be standing here at this Red Sea. Moses, we... Can you even imagine for a moment the pressure that is in the heart of Moses right now? We trusted you, Moses. It wasn't just ourselves. We brought our whole cattle with us. We brought our children with us. We followed you because we thought you're following God. But if you followed God, then this wouldn't have happened. If you were really listening to God, Moses, this has not, this shouldn't be planned out like that. We shouldn't be dying here in this wilderness. What have you done? done put yourself put yourself in Moses' shoes for a moment you got the chariots and the pharaoh behind you you got church people complaining all around you and you got the red sea in front of you put yourself in Moses' shoes for a moment you got the enemy chasing you from the back you got everybody discouraging you on the side and you got the red sea that is right in front of you and here is the dilemma of Moses' heart the biggest question that sometimes you and I have in our lives. How do I interpret this Red Sea? Is this Red Sea a closed door? Or is it a challenge? Is the Red Sea that I'm facing right now, is this the closed door that God is telling me that I've moved in a wrong direction? Or is it a challenge that God turns to you and says, it's time to stretch your faith and press on forward. When you follow God, it's not that simple. It's not that simple. It's easy to sit at church and worship Him for an hour and a half. But when you begin to follow God, you run up on some circumstances in your life. When you begin to wonder, God, is this a closed door where you're trying to redirect my life because I moved in the wrong direction? Or are you trying to tell me that I need to stretch my faith and keep on believing and keep on trying? Lord, I need to understand this is the Red Sea, a closed door, or is it a challenge for me to push through? It's difficult. It's difficult, Josh. You know why it's difficult? It's so difficult because God uses both. That's why this message is so hard for me to preach today. Because God uses both. He uses doors that are closed. And at the same time, He uses challenges that are hard. He is the God, the God that I serve. He's also a God of closed doors. If you've been following Him for a, for a little while, you understand when you move in the wrong direction... When you're following your own desires, when you're wanting the job that he didn't want you to have, when you want to apply to the school he didn't want you to have, you quickly realize that God has the ability to close some doors that you cannot open. If you would be honest with me here this morning, then you know that God is very able to shut some things down. When you followed God for a little, if you're honest, you know that there's an ability in God to tell you no. To tell you, no, this is not for you. But this is how you know that we have some mature people and grown people in this church. Because what you realize, there's some people that walk through life and seen some closed doors. When you turn around and look at the closed doors, you don't get mad at God. You begin to thank God. You begin to say hallelujah. You begin to say praise the Lord. Because if I got my way, I would have been bound to a hell way. So praise God that he closed some doors right in my face. Praise God I didn't marry who I want to marry. Praise God I didn't get the job that I wanted to get. I praise God for some closed doors. Do I have any mature people? in this house praise God I didn't get what I wanted but here's the reality God doesn't just uses closed doors he also uses challenges what you realize with God is that every walk with God every assignment by God is not easy breezy every day it's not rosy and cozy and everything is going smooth what you realize is that when you're faithful to God he intentionally puts some challenges on your path to stretch your faith. Yeah. 
When you follow God for a little bit, you realize that he is so able to use some challenges and put some challenges on your path. There's an ability that God has to allow some mountains so that you learn how to climb. God has the ability that he allows sometimes some haters and naysayers and fake people in your life. For what? So that you learn how to ignore some people when all you hear is negative voices. God allows sometimes certain things in your life not to kill you but to challenge you for you to get more rooted in who he called you to be. Amen. There's some challenges that you, that he allows. There's some problems that God would allow. But he doesn't allow these problems to kill you. He allows these problems so you finally learn how to pray. So there's certain things that it's not a closed door. It's a challenge where God says, listen baby, it's not time to quit. It's time to put your feet in the sand and stand alongside with Jacob and says, listen, I am not leaving until you bless me. There's certain moments in your life and you're facing the challenge and you feel like everything is against you. But it's not a moment to quit. It's you to fight your way through. It's pray your way through. It's battle your way through. It's wrestle your way through. Because you got to move on forward. But how do I know? That's the question. How do I know the difference? How do I know if what I'm facing today is a closed door and God telling me to redirect myself or is it God telling me challenging me a challenge of God in my life so that I can stretch my faith and become a bigger person that he wants me to be how do I know that this rejection letter that I got that I should should I stay at the job that I'm now in or is this rejection letter God telling me that I need to go and apply for a different job how do I know the disappointment that I'm facing? Is this me having to bow down and surrender that it's the will of God or it's a challenge of God telling me that I need to press on toward Him and read more of His Word? How do I know that the trouble that I'm experiencing in my dating relationship, God telling me that she's not the one or should I just pick her up and lay her at the altar and pray until she changes? How do I know? How do I know? And that's a, that's a, really, that's a really good question. Because what you see in this story, a whole multitude of people looks at the Red Sea and says, that's a closed door. Moses, you done messed up. And Moses turns to them, he says, that's not a closed door. It's a challenge and an opportunity for you and I to grow in our faith. How do I know the difference between the Red Sea being a closed door or being a challenge? Are you still with me? How do I know? Now, you're not going to like it. You're not going to like the answer to this question. Because the answer to this question is yet another question. The answer to this question is another question that only you can answer here sitting. I can't answer it for you and neither any of your neighbors or the people that know you. The way for you to get the answer to this question, you have to be honest with yourself. How do I know whether it's a closed door or a challenge? Here's another question that answers this. Here's another question that answers this question. How did you get to where you are? Did I lose anybody here? How did I get to where you are? How did you get to where you are? The difference between the closed door and a challenge is determined by you being honest on how did you get to where you are? Here's what Moses understands and lets him know that the reason I'm standing at the Red Sea is not my own desire. I was led by God. The people turn to him and say, Moses, you done messed up because they think that Moses is following his own desires. He says, listen, did you not see the cloud, the pillar of cloud that was leading us out? You weren't able to discern, but it wasn't my own desire. It was God convicting me and leading me. And the reason I'm here is not because of my personal desire, but because of my de prayerful discernment. Now you're not getting this yet. What well, Moses is turning to the crowd and he's telling them, he says, listen, the reason I'm here is not because of my own doing. I didn't get here and pray. I prayed my way here. Listen, what you have to understand is I didn't follow my own desires that got here. I didn't pray my, I didn't pray when I got here. I prayed all the way through. That's the problem of our Christian walk is because we make decisions and we get there and then we begin to pray. 
That's not right. We got to start praying and go alongside and then you will be able to tell the difference what's between what's real closed door and what's a challenge because there are certain times you understand that you know that you know I didn't get here on my own doing. I didn't get here on my own doing. I didn't lead myself here. I didn't turn to any of you and said, listen, I'm tired of Egypt. I'm tired of Pharaoh. Now follow me as I'm going to lead you. No, no, no. It was God who spoke into my life. I didn't talk to God when I got here. I talked with God all the way through. Consider Moses' prayer record. Moses is telling him, listen, I've been talking with God since chapter 3. I, me and you are in chapter, in chapter 14. Moses says, I've been talking to God since chapter 3. He told me something and I heard him and I obeyed him. Listen, in chapter 4, I obeyed God. And even when I didn't want to go to Pharaoh, I went. In chapter 5, I told God it didn't work. In chapter 6, I asked God for help and he gave me Aaron. In chapter 7, in chapter 7, I, God told me to keep on doing this thing. I obeyed in chapter 8. I surrendered in chapter 9. I walked with God in chapter 10. I did what he wanted me to do in chapter 12 and by the time I got here I prayed my way here so the reason I know it's not a closed door but a challenge is because it wasn't my own desire I was led by God I seen the hand of God all the way throughout this journey now here's the question can you say today that the dilemma you're facing right now you prayed your way to it now when it gets quiet, because 90, truth be told, 99% of the Red Seas we face, we got there by our own desire. I don't, I don't, I don't want to offend you, but every Red Sea that you faced was God didn't lead you there. You see, they see a closed door. Why? Because they didn't have the same prayer life that Moses had. They didn't surrender to God. They didn't talk to God. They didn't even want to hear God. And listen, here's the answer for you. And if you don't have any moments with God that led you here, where you struggled with God, where you laid that thing before God, where you prayed to God about it all day and all night, then maybe what you're facing, I'm 100% certain, is not a challenge. It's a closed door because you kept on following your own desire. If you haven't talked to God about it, the heartache, maybe it's God saying no. The job opportunity, the rejection letter, maybe God is saying to you, this is not my will. Listen, it's simple. The formula is laid out. If there's no prayer, it's a closed door. But here's the good news. If you are like Moses sitting here in this place and you've been talking to God from day one about it and if you have struggled with God and you have surrendered to the will of God that you didn't even want to do but you know his will is always better than your will. If you've worn out the carpet on the side of your bed, if you have called your prayer partner to the point where they blocked your number, then rest, be restfully assured that listen, this is not a closed door. This is a challenge for you to struggle stretch your faith because you have been following God it's a good advice listen it's a good advice that I'm about to give you if you have been following God and you've wrestled with him and you know that you know that you know that the reason I'm here is not by my own doing but it's because I surrendered my life to him and my prayer has been Lord let your will be done in my life whether I want it or not whether I'm scared about it or not I have an amazing advice for you and it's an advice that Moses gives to the Israelites and it's the best advice that you're going to get this morning as I'm closing Moses tells the children of Israel listen listen I know you hear Pharaoh behind you I know that you see the Red Sea in front of you. I know that you messed up, but let me give you some advice. Stand still. <gasps> Amen. Stand still. Now, you're not excited about it because you don't know Hebrew. Neither do I, but I have to look some stuff up sometimes. In Hebrew, stand still is a Hebrew verb, yatsav. You know what yatsav means? Yatsav doesn't mean for you to just stand still passively. Yatsav actually means to present yourself to God and let God work it out. Moses wasn't telling the nation of Israel to just stand here, be depressed. How you, no, no, he says, listen, now it's not the time to back down. It's time to press in. Present yourself to God and let God be God. 
There comes a moment in your life, he says, listen, there's things you don't understand and there's no way that you can see. But in that moment, it's not a time to back down, church. In that moment, it's not a time to throw in a towel. In that moment, it's to turn to God and say, listen, I present my heart. I present my way. I present my ambitions. I present my dreams. I lay it on all before you. Would you do what only you can do? And here's the guarantee and a promise without fear of contradiction. When you need God like that, there's no way he's going to stay silent. When you gave your life to Him and you followed Him to the best of your ability and you were sincere in your motivations, there's no way that He's going to let you keep on standing there and be swallowed up by Pharaoh. The God that I know is going to fight your battles. He turns to them and He says, stand still. Stand still. This is not a closed door. This is a challenge. Let me tell you something. Jesus died for every single one of you to live in freedom. Do you believe that? So don't let the devil tell you that your anxiety is a closed door. Don't let the devil tell you that your marital issues is a closed door. Divorce is only the option. Don't let the devil tell you that cancer is a closed door. It's a challenge for God to show His glory. Don't let the devil tell you that your addiction is something that you're going to die and bring with you to your grave. Don't let him do that because it's a challenge. A way to freedom sometimes is very challenging, but it's possible when the Holy Spirit begins to do his work in you. When you say, not my will, your will be done. Listen, stand still and watch the glory of the Lord. Would you get up with me on your feet, but quietly, I want to say something else to you this morning. Stand still and watch, and watch, and watch, and watch. He tells him, stand still. But then he turns to him and he says, listen, it's not enough to just present yourself right now. I need you to do something else, church. He turns to the people and he says, listen, don't just present yourself. Fear not. He tells him, I don't want you to just lay it before God. I also don't want you to be consumed with it. He says, listen, I need you to fear not. What are they afraid of? They're afraid of Pharaoh. They're afraid of their past catching up with them. They're afraid of their old ways coming after them. They're afraid that it's going to cost them everything and he's going to take them back to Egypt. He says, fear not. Why is Moses not afraid? Because Moses is living out the Word of God. Catch this. Moses knew something they didn't. They thought Moses was wrong, but Moses knew that God was right. Because you know what happened in chapter 14? God turns to Moses and he says, listen, I'm going to change Pharaoh's mind. He's going to come right after you. But when you see him, he's not there to kill you. He's there for me to get glory over him. Fear not because what you're going through right now, God already knew from the beginning of the world. And so what God is telling you, all things will work together for your good. Fear not. It's not the time to be afraid. It's time to read the Word, live the Word, be founded on the Word of God, and watch the salvation of the Lord. Watch the salvation of the Lord. Here's what I can tell you this morning. I don't know how, but I know He will. I don't know when, but I know He will. Because He that promises is not a man that He should lie. Because every promise in the Lord is yes and amen. Now it's time for you and I, whether you're by the Red Sea and you look at it as a challenge or your Red Sea is not a challenge but a closed door, you know what you and I need this morning? We need supernatural faith. We need supernatural faith. It takes supernatural faith for you to lay it down and say, God, I guess if this is not for me, this relationship is not for me, this job's not for me, this school's not for me, then God give me the ability to say, not my will, but your be done. And I know it will turn out for my good. Or maybe you're standing in front of a challenge and it's attacking your marriage. It's ruining your heart. Now is the time for supernatural faith. Why? Because if you worship,